Having both been raised largely secular, our friends who were living according to secularism were all miserable. But our friends who were Christian, they were happy. We thought, wait, this, what's going on here? Why is this group of people, these Christians, why are they happy? And all of our friends who were atheists are all miserable. Does that tell you something? And that's more persuasive than many arguments. Okay, we have a treat today on the podcast. We've got Michael Knowles here in studio of The Michael Knowles Show. We just did an actually interview over at the live action space, which you can watch on the live action podcast. But we're here to talk about some other stuff. So, Michael, thanks for sitting down. Thank you for having me. Now now we can get to the really juicy stuff. Yes, You know, exactly. that was the hors d'oeuvre. Yes, there you go. I like that. I like that mentality. Our sponsor today is Every Life. Every Life is the diaper company that's making great products that are ethically sourced, that are good for your little ones, diapers and wipes that are pro-life. It's a pro-life company. So check out everylife.com. You can order diapers and wipes, a subscription service for your little one or your friend's little one as a baby shower gift. They're beautifully packaged and they're just great products and they're pro-life and they're donating money back to the pro-life movement. Check out everylife.com and use the code LILA10 at checkout for 10% off your order. So I want to talk about, we're going to talk about relationship stuff. You do give dating advice on your podcast, I, I've heard. I do my best. Which is uh, interesting for a man who's dated one woman. Well, <laughs> or, 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 we split oh. up for a little bit in college. Oh, okay. So okay. I, I feel, I'm not really bragging about this, but I mentioned earlier, Lila, that I was an atheist for about 10 years. And I lived and behaved like an atheist. And so I was single and, you know, dating other women for a relatively short period of time compared to people who do it for, you know, decades. But I made the most of my time, Okay, I'd say. And uh, so having made plenty of mistakes, gone down bad paths, mercifully saved from those paths by God's grace and my sweet little Lisa, my wife, uh, I try to make sure that other people don't uh, fall into the same pitfalls. Excellent. So your lovely wife, you did meet her, though, in the fourth grade? Yeah, we, so there's some debate. Okay. We, I think we met in fifth grade district orchestra. She was from Bedford Village, New York. That's the right side of the tracks. I was from Bedford Hills. That's the wrong side of the tracks. Both are relatively impoverished to, compared to where AOC grew up. Uh, you know, <laughs> Jenny from the block, um, who was in the town right over. But we were both, I think I was the penultimate chair in district orchestra as a violinist, and Alyssa was maybe the ultimate chair. So we, neither of us were particularly good at this. She has no recollection of meeting me there. And so she insists we met in sixth grade homeroom, which I do remember. Then she had a crush on me in eighth grade, and but I was dating my co-star as the lead of the eighth grade play. And Who was that? What was that play? That was Guys and Dolls, okay. my favorite musical. And then... Uh, I had a crush on Alyssa in ninth grade. She was dating a much older man, an upperclassman. Well, didn't like that. Uh, I thought all hope is lost. And then we started dating junior year of high school, dated for high school. And what's odd is neither of us wanted to split for college. But everybody around us, our families, our friends, our every, the whole culture said, you have to, it's insane. You can't continue to date your high school sweetheart in college. How go- far away were your colleges going to be? Pretty far. You know, I was in Connecticut and she was in Maryland. So it's a bit of a hike. Made the trip Mm -hmm. once or twice. But uh, so we split for college. And then by the end, you know, I'm running arms outstretched, pleading to get my high school sweetheart back, uh, which she took me back after a little while. And uh, now we joke. I mean, we think, why didn't we? We should have gotten married at 18. Maybe that wouldn't have worked either. But All's well that ends well, I guess. All's well that ends well, and you have two beautiful children. Yes. And how many years married now? We were married for six, five years. Beautiful. Five or six years. You should know that immediately. I know. Make sure that anniversary date is imprinted deeply in your soul, Michael. All right. So, but you're saying that for 10 years with Alyssa, Alyssa. Alyssa. It's uh, actually Alyssa. Alyssa. But you I, said Alyssa I earlier. say Alyssa because uh, it's very So confusing. I'm right and you're, you're wrong. You're right and I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, it's because when we dated in high school, I would pronounce her name with an Italian accent. Okay, to I try to win her heart. To win her heart. How did Casanova. That, you know, sounds like that worked a little worked bit. pretty well, Don Oh, Giovanni I guess in the here. end, yes. Yeah. How much Italian are you, Michael? I am uh, only, half, I guess, half Italian. It depends on how you count Sicilian. Some people count oh, that's that it's Italian. separate, you know. Yeah. Some say it's North African. But, and then I would be an African-American. But I'm about half Italian, 
Calabrese and Sicilian, and then a quarter wasp, you know, English, and a quarter Irish. Okay. So that's where I have this name, which is very English, Knowles, which some think is an anglicization of cannoli at Ellis Island, <laughs> but it's it's not. Could have been. Could have, Could have been. been. Well, that's a, I have it in common because we're... We are actually a quarter Italian, a quarter Sicilian, if you want to separate mm, them out. Yes, me too. My, my mother was just uh, in her homeland recently in Italy and just enjoying being, she's like, I could live here. I was like, well, yeah, your, your ancestors did. They did. So, <laughs> okay. So, Alyssa, Alyssa, yes. who you call Alyssa to try to win her heart, That's which is- very romantic. You know. uh, okay. All right. All right. Um, so, you were on and off with Alyssa, yeah. but you said at the same time, these were your years of atheism when you were- Sowing yeah. wild oats, or yeah, certainly, yeah. How yeah, does was, how does that well, how does that work? I became and an why atheist. were you an atheist? Because I was a punk kid, and it wasn't all my fault. It was mostly my fault because I I was a precocious thirteen year old, which means I thought I was a lot smarter than I really was, much smarter than every intelligent person who ever lived. And the parts that were not my fault is I lived during the time of Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris which was this publishing phenomenon, really, more than an intellectual movement, the New Atheists, and during the time of the church sex scandals, so it was not, not great for the church in the news and in the uh, hierarchy. And also it was the time, and this bears a lot of responsibility, I think, of extraordinarily weak catechesis, uh, felt banners and a confusion of orthodoxy because of a whole series of unfortunate errors that followed after the Second Vatican Council. So the, you know, people always try to point out that the, they want to blame all of the errors that happened on the Second Vatican Council. And that, that would be a discussion for another time, maybe. Mm. But there were all, you know, there's nothing in the documents of the Second Vatican Council that says that uh, catechists need to start preaching heresy. <laughs> and, you know, uh, all, all this kind of sappy, awful hymns, you know. And the part that I think is not the least of these issues is the the weak catechesis at that time you know the the scandal of eucharistic abuse in the liturgy and of confusion being taught in classrooms and at the pulpit you know i had some wonderful catechism teachers but even a couple of good catechism teachers can't overcome error that is being promoted by higher ups in the church you know and and so even the music, you know, how can the church expect men, and especially young teenage boys, to sing along to these sappy, light in the loafers, 1970s <laughs> hymns, you know, about one eagles man, wings? Oh, body. oh, my. I mean, they weren't even cool in the 70s. <laughs> and you expect, I could be singing good, solid. The Lord of all. I mean, there's, there's some lovely words and intentions there, but I, I hear the point. Lila, I will never raise you or anybody else up on eagles wings. <laughs> I won't do that. Some people love that song, Michael. They uh, cried for that song. They want it at their funeral. De gustibus non disputandum est, you know. And so all of that coupled together i just thought so you heard eagle's wings I, basically <laughs> said, I, I said, that's, I am now that's the last straw i i just thought at the time christianity was for stupid people mm -hmm. and smart people either were atheist in the reddit kind of way of christopher hitchens or they were eastern you know non non theological religious people yeah, spiritualist you know like they'd play sitar which i do i actually learn sitar mm -hmm. And so I did everything I could to avoid Christianity. And then my atheism weakened starting freshman year in college because I met my ra randomly, providentially assigned roommate, who remains my best friend, you know, godfather to each other's kids and everything, uh, who himself was kind of agnostic. But he introduced me to Alvin Plantinga's modal ontological argument for God which was a reformulation of St. Saint, Saint Anselm of Canterbury's ontological argument, which was rejected, really, by St. Thomas Aquinas. And I thought it was kind of funny that you've got this Calvinist philosopher at a Catholic university, Notre Dame, making this argument that's a rewriting of a Catholic argument for the existence of God that the most famous doctor of the Catholic Church rejected. And that was what convinced me, or at least put me on the right path, because it at least showed me when I, when I got to college they were very smart, many of them much smarter than me, and most of them atheists. But the very smartest people were not atheists. They were religious, and they were Christian, and basically all of them 
were or ended up Catholic. Although that's kind of weird. And it's still, I'm a little slow, so it took me a number of years. But by 23, I I finally seeded with my intellect that uh, the truth that most people just understand intuitively. And became, well, you already were raised Catholic, so you just came back into communion. Confession. Confession, good sturdy confession. Go to Mass. I was not a convert, but a revert. I reverted. I love the clothes that I've been ordering from Carly Jean Los Angeles. I got my new favorite pair of jeans from there recently. It's been so hard for me to find good jeans that actually fit me. These jeans fit me, and they're comfortable, and they're cute, and you're going to love the clothes at Carly Jean Los Angeles. Go to carlyjeanlosangeles.com. Check it out. They've got some really great stuff in for fall. There's some really cute sweaters and dresses. You're going to love it. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com is a company that shares your values, that has really cute clothes that are ethically sourced and comfortable and really for every occasion. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com and use the code Lila Rose for 20% off your order at checkout. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. And then you, once you and Alyssa got married, she was already Catholic or what was her story? Uh, no, she was, uh, my wife was raised in a secular kind of uh, environment. And, uh, but I'll tell you, she asked the priest, she said, do I need to convert for the wedding? And our priest in his great wisdom said, uh, no, don't convert if you want to convert, but don't do it for the wedding. And so we had those conversations mm-hmm. later. But uh, at, so the wedding was not a full mass. It's quite beautiful, though. It was the Church of St. Michael, coincidentally, in New York. And, uh, and then it was something else that we were noticing around this time, which is that having both been raised largely secular, uh, our friends who were living according to secularism were all miserable, just anxious. And, but our friends who were Christian, we were surrounded by a lot of Protestants at the time, Protestants are very good at seeming happy and everything. They were happy. Catholics sometimes were a little, we play closer to the vest, but the Protestants really kind of wear it on their sleeve a lot of the time. We thought, wait, this, what's going on here? Why is this group of people, these Christians, why are they happy? And all of our friends who are atheists are all miserable. Does that tell you something? And, uh, and that's, that's more persuasive than many arguments. The joy of the Lord. It's yeah. a real thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a real thing. I remember becoming Catholic in college and, when I, my day of confirmation and first Eucharist was not particularly emotional, to be honest, which kind of surprised me, but I also knew, I, you know, I I think the headspace I was in at the time, but afterwards, the peace, the kind of intangible peace that brings joy, it's real. It's real and profound and it's never left and thank God for it. It's just the best decision of my life. I noticed it in confession, which actually around Southern California, where we are now, I was at a church, uh, St. John the Baptist in Costa Mesa, and I was online for confession. This was when I was kind of coming back into the church, and I gave my confession. And I said, oh, Father, you know, I fell into the sin of pride, and I also uh, committed the sin of lust, and uh, a little bit the sin of wrath. You know, and he cuts me off. He said, hey, man, do you, he didn't say man, he said, do you do this often? <laughs> do you confess often? I said, I'm trying to start going to confession now. He goes, yeah. He goes, that's not how you do it. <laughs> I need specificity. I need detail. I need uh, the number of times you've committed these sins because otherwise you're just going to give the same ambiguity every week and then you're going to keep doing it. I said, oh, okay. All right, that's good. And so I, le- I learned how to give a proper confession in my 20s here at, in Southern California. And I, I find this with confession. I've confessed my sins many, many times and still I have a kind of terror of it. I'm standing in the line and I, I don't, it's, I often do not sin because I don't want to confess the sin, <laughs> which is not the perfect reason not to sin, but it'll get you there. But, but I, I have this terror of it. I know the priest. I, I'm not going to say anything to this priest. He hasn't heard a billion times before. I still have this terror of it. And, and I, I find if I've committed a sin, if I'm out of the state of grace, it's much easier for me to fall into sins. I'm just kind of, it's like a snowball. And, uh, and I'm in there. The moment I hear Ego Te Absolvo, you know, it's gone. And like I talked to an exorcist about this once. And I said, Father, I, what I can't figure out is I understand the spiritual piece that would come with confession uh, because I think it's a real sacrament. It's really do. But 
What about the physical aspect? I could go into confession racked with wrath, just angry. Some guy cut me off and I didn't, and uh, my, the dry cleaners ruined my tuxedo to use a touching example right now. <laughs> and I, I'm so angry. And then I go, or, or I'm racked with lust, pride, gluttony, I don't know, whatever, all of them. And I come out of the confessional and I don't even feel the same physical thing. And he said to me, oh, well, yes, Michael, that's because uh, confession cuts demons off of you. Wow. He said, that's what's, if you want to visualize it, that's what happens. And demons, they're like, you know, wild dogs. They kind of form packs and they attract others along the way. And, but, but you, you realize that it's all real. Mm. And I, I keep re-realizing this. No matter how many times I do it, I'm somehow still surprised that it's real. What's so remarkable is there's, I think, a whole generation of Catholics, and I meet them, that they were raised Catholic, right? And then they become evangelical later because as being raised Catholic, they never really were catechized. They never really experienced the faith in a way that could touch them at the deepest level in, yeah. in their experience, right? I do think, obviously, the sacrament of baptism, it touches you whether you might feel it or not emotionally in that moment. But uh, why do you think that is, that there's this whole generation of fallen away, let's call them Catholics, Many who are living a faith life beautifully in many ways as evangelicals, but they they had the sacraments, but they didn't feel them or they didn't fully understand them in their minds. Lex orandi, lex credendi is the way it's traditionally understood. The law of worship is going to be the law of belief. And, like, and what follows from that is lex vivendi. It's going to be the way that you live too. And... Uh, you, you know, some people make too big a deal out of the liturgical upheaval that occurred after the Second Vatican Council. But the vast majority of people don't make nearly enough of a deal about it. You have the Mass of the Ages. This was the, the traditional Latin Mass, it's called, codified at the Council of Trent. So it's called the Tridentine Mass. But it's not from Trent. This Mass goes back in basically its full form, almost its entire form, to St. Gregory the Great, okay? So you're talking- What year is that? Around 600. So you're talking about a mass that's been around for, at the very least, 1,400 years. And it really, it goes back further than that. I mean, you can see elements of it going back to the really earliest days of the church, um, all, of, all of which was thrown out the window. 92% of which was thrown out the window, really. You know, I mean, the, the core of the mass is preserved, the sacrifice on the altar, you know, the transubstantiation of the host- that is preserved. But the entire liturgy surrounding it, even the orientation of it, you know, the traditional mass, it, it, the priest is facing the altar. We know sometimes in this very selfish way, we say, oh, he's facing away from us. No, 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 he's not. He's facing the altar. You're all facing the altar together and you are oriented toward the sacrifice as a spectator would have been oriented toward the cro cross at Calvary. Uh, the, the liturgical innovations and degradations that took place after the Second Vatican Council turned that all around based on just erroneous understandings of even how the early Christians lived. Uh, there was this erroneous belief that in early masses, the priest faced the people. And there, it's a, kind of a long story as to why they thought that, but it just turned out not to be true. It just wasn't the case. Uh, uh, you know, the, the notion that the early Christians were all just hippies living a really minimalist kind of sterile way. It's just not true. That that was never true. But isn't it also true that Vatican II, even what it uh, dictates and recommends, I think some are dictations, some are recommendations about the mass, many are not even properly followed today. Of course not. So that's part of, of the issue is yeah. that you can have a novus ordo mass that has a tremendous amount of reverence and beauty in it. Like yeah. that does exist. I've been to one. I've oh, been to yeah. them before. Uh, but then you can have those that the reverence seems very lacking and you're very frustrated with the, you know, the maybe some even uh, things that are not uh, correct in the liturgy that they are missing or they've added or whatever. And that's not the novus ordo necessarily. That's a a depletion of it or a corruption of it. That's the nice way to put it, I guess. <laughs> and, and of course, the, I mean, I, I re-entered And I think the, the Latin Mass is beautiful. Yeah. But the, I, I re-entered the church with through a traditional Novus Ordo liturgy, and I, I think they can be nice. But the fact that we have to say reverent Novus Ordo, the fact that we have to qualify that with an adjective, to me tells the whole story. And, you know, we always hear, well, 
the new mass wasn't implemented as it should have been. And the reformers of the liturgy, so-called, they just didn't really pay attention to the documents of the council as they should have. Well, yeah, okay, but at a certain point, when are we going to acknowledge that this is the way these things are consistently implemented in a way that's extraordinarily irreverent? And so there there can be a reverend Novus Ordo Mass, I totally agree. But even the most reverend Novus Ordo Mass still loses so much, removes a huge number of prayers, removes a huge number of crossings and genuflections and kneeling and uh, just the richness of the liturgy. And, you know, the Mass is not something that was just invented by man. It's not just the whims of some churchmen over the course of 2,000 years. We see the Mass, we see a mystical reading of the Holy Mass in the book of Revelation. You know, this is something that has been handed down to us. And so it has persisted. Some will say, well, that's the old Mass. Well, uh, I don't think it's very old. I go to it every week. Mm -hmm. It's been around the whole time. Uh, And certain popes have clamped down on it more and certain popes have opened it up more to the faithful who love it. So I don't think it's going anywhere. And I think that what some people ridiculously, risibly called the old mass is the future of the church, um, b- precisely because it's not merely a product of man. But I do think that that was a big part of it. I mean, you can, when they upended the mass, you, you know, we were told this was going to lead to a period of people refilling the pews and, you know, a new Pentecost. And it just didn't happen. The opposite happened. The pews totally emptied out. And if you go to the 1970s style masses today, the median age is about 106, and there are no children anywhere, and there are no priests, really. And if you go to the traditional Latin mass, the median age is eight. Uh, and if, even if you take the kids out, the median age is like 24. And it's because that is attractive to young people who maybe, like me, fell away from the faith during periods of confusion and soft soap and, and weak preaching. And who, if they are to return, they're not going to return for more of that. They're not going to return for more of the world. I get plenty of the world every day of the week. They're going to return for something that is beyond the world, pointing toward beyond the world. And they're going to, they're going to come for truth. Mm. Seven Weeks Coffee is gourmet, delicious, organic, ethically sourced coffee. If you're a coffee snob and you like to drink really delicious coffee and only good coffee, you're going to love Seven Weeks. Check out sevenweekscoffee.com. Pick your favorite roast. Use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off and order it. And know that every time you buy Seven Weeks Coffee, 10% of all the proceeds from that sale go directly to fund pregnancy resource centers. So not only are you getting some of the best gourmet coffee in the world that's ethically sourced and organic and delicious, you are supporting the pro-life movement and pro-life pregnancy resource centers that are helping moms and babies with every sip of delicious coffee. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Well, I do see, I mean, amongst those thriving parishes, like even here in Southern California, maybe they don't have the Latin mass, but there's still a thriving there because there's an orthodoxy um, in the leadership and the pastoral leadership. There's an attention to the family to not just like, you know, our beautiful elders, but we want young children here. We're going to accommodate young families, activities for young families, catechesis for young families. That's excellent. And yeah, do I wish the masses were more reverent? Uh, You know, I have maybe different standards than others, of course, but there's a, there's a liveliness to it, you know, a life to it. And there's many people there. There. So I think you're on to something for sure. But I think the biggest issue I've, I've seen is just a lack of catechesis and community. Yeah. Because in the Protestant tradition today, if you could call it the tradition, but uh, the anti-tradition. Against the, yeah, the Protestant innovation. But there's a very big, I mean, they have community. That's the focus. Yeah. And I think that's a, very attractive to many people. Yeah. Why did you choose when you became a non-atheist who left your atheism? Why did you choose Catholicism and not evangelicalism. It sounds like you had both Protestant and Catholic friends. I did, and I I would have considered myself evangelical, at least in uh, demeanor, for for a part of that reversion, for precisely what you're describing, because all the young, cool kids who who really seem to believe it, a lot of them were evangelical, you know, non-denominational Protestants, capital N, capital D, trademark over the L. But that, that was very attractive to me. And, uh, you know, that's that's really a scandal of the Catholic Church, that the Church can't present that kind of joy 
uh, in in certain quarters. Obviously, in many quarters, it it does. But that's that's a big problem. Uh, what ultimately, though, I think led me to come back home in the long long way, as long as it possibly could be, probably, is uh, well, what what Peter says to our Lord, which is when our Lord says, "My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink." And if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any life in you. And people go away. And then our Lord turns to the apostles and says, you're not going away. And said, Peter says, well, to whom shall we go? And so I believe that our Lord gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven to St. Peter and said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I believe the historical claims of the church. I believe the theological and ecclesiological claims of the church because I need to. Because no matter how heinous the decisions made by certain bishops or whoever can be, you ultimately have to ask, well, where does the authority come from? I might disagree with any number of people, but on what authority do I get to believe that the thing I think is true actually is true? And uh, St. John Henry Newman, famously a rather anti-Catholic Protestant who then became a Catholic saint, uh, he, he described the, the distinction between Catholicism and Protestantism ultimately as a question of authority. The, for the Protestant, it, authority ultimately rests with individual conscience. Even, even John Calvin, who was a very intelligent man and, and a much more of a systematic thinker than most of those early Protestant revolutionaries, ultimately when he was asked why he, he believed there were only 66 books in the Bible contrary to uh, many centuries of Christian belief, he said, oh, well, I just felt an inner working of the Holy Spirit within me. Basically, he said, I just think so. I just heard a, heard a voice, which is weak sauce for someone of John Calvin's intellect, uh, whereas the church can say, you know, we have the authority, we have the deposit of faith, the magisterium, and we are the divinely instituted body of Christ on earth. And it reminds me of that Hilaire Belloc quote, mm. because I don't want it to seem like I'm dissing my Protestant friends or that I'm papering over scandals and problems of the church. I'm not at all. What Hilaire Belloc said is that he had to take it as a matter of faith that the church really is the church. But for a non-believer, proof of its divine institution would be that no other institution conducted with such knavish imbecility <laughs> would have lasted a fortnight. <laughs> and I totally agree. I think it's incredible that even with the corrupt, you know, priests and popes and certainly lay people, plenty of corrupt yep. uh, Catholic lay people over the years, you know, horrible stories. And, you know, the, you mentioned the sex abuse scandals uh, earlier and like absolutely heinous. I mean, just you have these Catholics doing horrible things, Judas Iscariot, the, you know, right. the OG, right? Um, and we can do horrible things, but that the teaching has r remained consistent and constant and true for 2,000 years, despite the people that are in power that are not some of them to be trusted, that the Holy Spirit really has protected his people, his church. And, you know, you mentioned the, you know, the Calvin saying, well, I felt like the Holy Spirit or, you know, God, something told me to remove the books from these books I didn't like in the Bible, you know, Maccabees, take it out. And I remember I was raised Protestant and I read Maccabees and I was like, this is incredible stuff. These guys, these like <laughs> seven sons who are standing up for their faith and their mother saying, you know, be willing to die for the faith. And I was just like, this, I needed this stuff as a young Protestant girl. But, um, but all this to say, you know, the Holy Spirit, of course, is active among our Protestant brothers and sisters and in the evangelical community. The Holy Spirit's active everywhere because that's his power. But like you said, what's the final authority? If one Bible-believing Christian says it's this way and the other says in full sincerity it's that way, and these are things that cannot coexist, they're two interpretations of the same thing, who decides? Right. There's also... There's a great... And that's why we have 50,000 denominations today right. in the Protestant community. Exactly. Uh, th there's a, a former speechwriter for Trump mm. who is now an author in, in his own right. I just follow him on Twitter, Josh Charles. Mm. And he's a Protestant, very radical Protestant, who has become Catholic. And he said... And he writes... The reason I follow him on Twitter is because he writes these beautiful essays and with long quotations on patristics, you know, for, for going as far back as one can go. And what made him Catholic, other than the Holy Spirit, is that he, as a you know, righteous young Protestant, was going to prove that the early church was Protestant, not Catholic. And so he went back and he read the church fathers and he found out it was Catholic. He found out that what the fathers believed remains 
essentially unchanged even 2,000 years later, and that many of his beliefs when he was Protestant are, are found nowhere in, in the church fathers. Mm. And there's something funny today, too, which is that, you know, as you can imagine, I'm not the biggest Martin Luther guy, but Mar- the views of me and Martin Luther are on many topics much closer than the views of supposedly Lutheran Protestants and Martin Luther. And, and so there's a kind of funny irony that Luther and Calvin would probably have burned many modern Protestants <laughs> at the stake and certainly burned their books uh, because there there is that... Uh, Consistency. They're closer. I mean, uh, Martin Luther, even though he was obviously protesting some things that in practice should be protested, not sure, in the yeah. doctrine, but in the practice of things that were abuses, there always have been, and there always will be as long as human beings populate the church, right? Yeah. But, you know, he was passionately anti-contraception as an example, and yep. I'm sure you're referring that in what you just said, and today it's hard to find that among the large majority of Protestants, including in the Lutheran tradition, you know, there's an acceptance of things that even their founding fathers rejected morally. So there's a, there's a lot to that. But um, one more thing I wanted to get into with you, Michael, is back to your love story with your lovely wife. And we have a lot of people listening to the podcast on relation, listening for relationship stories, advice. Um, what is your advice? It's chaotic. We talked about the Whatever podcast on my on our last podcast for live action, and you did a fantastic job on the Whatever podcast. Talking Thank about you. You as well. Ladies. Thank you. And you were great, Thank too, you. because I... I was sort of on the side of the women. I tried to be, at least for a lot of it, against the host, Brian. But you completely destroyed that red pill guy with facts and logic. It was great. It was, an inten- it was not intentional destruction. It was more, I sincerely wanted to understand you know, that, that worldview more. Because I've learned more about red pill in the last year. And it, it, it does crumble in on itself. Because to say I have so much um, self-control or I have so much power as a man to do all of this good... But then I don't have power in the most physical bodily sense right. <laughs> over my appetites. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't add up. So what's your advice, though, for, you know, you're, you're, let's start with the men, the young men listening about it, particularly those who are not married yet or seeking marriage. How does one find I mean, you met your wife in middle arguably school, middle, middle latest, school. Yeah. So I, do you have advice on that, on the terrible world of dating today, how difficult it is. And it relates to the red pill guys, because the red pill guys are right that our present legal system is terribly unfair to men. It's ter- it's horrifically unfair. And our culture encourages uh, divorce and all sorts of terrible things. So I, I have a great deal of sympathy for them. Uh, and they point out, well, half of marriages end in divorce, which is not exactly true, but you know, let's call it 40%, call it high 30s or something. Uh, but among those who are educated, who have faith, who don't cohabitate, the marriage rates are actually very strong and very high. Well, there you go. That's a big key because I pointed out to these red pill guys, I said, uh, you know, you're right that the divorce rates are high, but among Catholics, just to use my own religion, uh, it's much lower. And by the way, some people call themselves Catholics who don't really believe the faith at all. A lot of people do that. Uh, so when you just focus on people who believe in the faith, call themselves traditional Catholics, or so it's silly that you have to qualify it, the rates drop precipitously, much, much further. So I said, so my advice would be, you're totally right that there is a huge risk that when you get married, your wife's going to leave you, take your kids, take your money, the cor- courts are going to completely turn against you, your life is going to be... You're right, there's a huge risk. One way to mitigate against that risk would be to practice a religion <laughs> that not only forbids divorce, but does not even accept the, the possibility of divorce, that denies the very reality of such a thing. That's going to go a long way toward doing it. And, and you know... But they have to be chased for that, Michael. And they have to be chased. Yeah, they they got to be chased, yes. Yeah, the mean, Catholic faith, you need to be, and, and Christianity at large, women and men have an equal responsibility to chastity. And I think that's a that's challenging for red pill because they say men, because they have a harder time, because they're wired differently, they should not be held to the same standards as women. Men do have a harder time, and men are wired differently. I have red blood, you know, just like You're all Italian. of these other... I'm <laughs> Italian, just like all these other guys. But to suggest that we are merely slaves to our basest appetites is extru- extremely weak. It's, it's not merely to surrender our masculinity, it's to surrender our humanity, be- because 
it, the thing that makes us human is our reason. You know, a hog doesn't have reason, but we do. And so if we say, well, no, I'm only going to follow my, my appetitive will, my lower will, and not my rational will, which should be commanding my appetitive will, and the rational will is the mediator between the lower will and the divine will, well, then it's to surrender your whole humanity and you just become an animal. So th that would be weak stuff. And, and the other thing is you're not going to attract the kind of woman who is likely not to ruin your life if you are a scumbag, you're just, it's not going to happen. You well have, said. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, Aristotle talks about different kinds of friendship. And there's friendship of pleasure, which is where you just like doing the same stuff. And there's friendship of utility, which is networking, kind of, you know, you can help me, I'll help you. And the, But then there's true friendship, highest friendship, which is the friendship of virtue. And the friendship of virtue, Aristotle says, is only possible between good men, men who are concerned with virtue, practicing virtue, that's the, that's the only way you're going to have that kind of friendship. And if you're not doing that, if you're living a vicious kind of life, you're going to attract the like. And, and uh, there, there are ways out of it. None of us is perfect. None is good but God. But, but we actually can be sanctified and we actually can uh, be edified and we can practice virtue. You know, even it's amazing today. People don't understand that this is possible. But good old Uncle Aristotle spelled it all out that there are four kinds of people. There are the vicious people who are self-indulgent and gleefully so. So that's good. You know, I'm chasing all these women and it's awesome. I'm the man, right? And then there are the incontinent people who they, say, they recognize a moral standard, but they just fall short of it a lot. That's a lot of people. And then there are the continent people who recognize a moral standard, largely live up to it, but only through grit and you know, just grit in their teeth. And then... That's where most people think the story ends. But there's actually a fourth category, which Aristotle says is the only happy man, and that's the virtuous man who does good things and enjoys doing good things. Mm -hmm. And you can get closer to that. That's actually possible. But if you're just going to be Don Giovanni, you know, you're going to be a little pimp, Casanova, you're going to attract the kind of women that that attracts. And it's, that's not going to make you happy, and it's probably going to increase your, your likelihood of divorce. So then my advice for all these guys who are dealing with this is... What, uh, it, it, two sides of the advice. One is, be a good person. You know, do the things you're supposed to be doing. It's simple stuff. Uh, so that you are worthy of a good woman. On the other hand, you know, have fun. I, th I, some people take dating. Have like, fun. It's, <laughs> yes. I mean, they, they think have it's... Have fun meaning getting to know women, you know, obviously mm -hmm. chastely, but getting to know, taking a girl's out, figuring out, you know, who you're attracted to or who you're yeah. connected to build friendship with you know date is that what you mean by yes that? i mean yeah i'm not saying <laughs> meaning this is not some like doldrum thing where it's like in a an arranged marriage where now you yeah. sit down and you look stone-faced at another person and say do we share the same value even an arranged <laughs> marriage could be a lot more fun than what people are doing today i mean they, they treat it like it's <laughs> at least like, you get the bollywood dances exactly <laughs> yeah i mean the, the way people talk about it now well i'm you know i'm going to find a partner that is checks off this box and this box like you're like you're on a job interview and you go on a date you know dates are fun women are pretty they, they can be fun yes they can so be true i mean I, people will say michael how do i converse with a woman on a date I said, oh, man. Uh, do you like her yeah okay do you find her therefore somewhat interesting are you curious about her are you well then maybe the things that you desire about her that are elevated uh how about you inquire into those things you know how about you sincerely like the woman it'll come out you know i mean it's not uh, uh, it's not brain surgery i mean th this is where dante is really good dante writes the greatest poem ever written the divine comedy and it's about this girl not his wife by the way whom he met twice when she was nine and he loves her and she is this this symbol uh, of pulling him out of hell all the way through hell sends virgil down to help him and then up through purgatory and then up to heaven and he still desires her. He still loves her, even up in heaven. And he looks up at her eyes, and her eyes don't look at him. She's a little harsher on him. She's not cruel. She saves him his life. But she's looking at God, and he sees God reflected in her eyes. And I think that is a really good way of thinking about our will, you know, because what we come down to as humans is will and intellect. We're talking about the importance of reason and the rational will, of course, too. And so, uh, Donoso Cortez, the great Catholic political philosopher, observes that ch freedom is not in choosing between good and bad. You know, we're not really free if we don't. Because if that were the case, then the less inclined we are to choose evil, the less free we would be. 
right? It's not just this neutral ability to choose. Freedom is in will and understanding. And as you perfect your will and as you perfect your understanding, you, you then will t- truly be free. You won't have the freedom of the heroin addict in San Francisco. That guy's not free. He's a slave. You will have a, a true freedom and your will will be in the right place. That's what Chesterton said about the socialist atheist Bernard Shaw. He said, George Bernard Shaw has a very big heart, but it's not in the right place. So as, as, you, do, as you do that, as you grow in that way, you'll have a lot more fun and you'll find more beautiful, wonderful, uh, enchanting women and you'll have a much better life. Mm. And you'll end up in heaven. Well, one hopes. One hopes. We, will, we all hope. Thank you, Michael. That was excellent. I think that uh, will be a great um, encouragement to people listening. And find the woman who's looking at God. The yeah. fun, lovely woman who's seeking God because by looking in her eyes, you see, you can see God. That's right. Hopefully it won't be as tough for you to get there as it was for Dante. Yes. So well, you can get there. <laughs> no going through hell for all, all of right. us, hopefully. Right. Thank you, Michael. It's awesome. Thanks Thank for coming you. on the podcast. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Don't forget to leave us five stars on Apple. And don't forget to join the Patreon. We're getting some great people joining. I love it. The Patreon helps us fuel the podcast to reach more people. And so check out the Patreon. We're going to be doing a Q&A um, soon on it for our patrons. Go check out our Patreon and become a patron so that we can be in community together there. Thank you so much for all of those who are already supporting the podcast. I love your support. I love getting your messages and your notes. Keep them coming. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.